for this it may not be on the overhead because I didn't put it on the overhead 1 Samuel chapter 12 1 Samuel the 12th chapter I know many of you have your phones and things of that nature you look for I, li I like I always like having my Bible around even if I have the others so 1 Samuel chapter 12 I I have pressure on me during the week to try to have a the message for Sunday done by Thursday. The media department kind of demands that if I can have it done on Thursday, then they can get everything done on the overhead and get things done, uh, get it ready. Back in the day, my sermons weren't ready till Saturday night. I stewed on it for days thinking about it. So when you have one done by Thursday and you got Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, think about what you want to share with the people on Sunday, things change. They just start shifting things. I got it written down, but I don't want to stay uh, forced into this situation right you know, that I have on my iPad. So I think, Lord, what, what would you like for me to share? And this message has always been so uh, real and raw to me. We have people in such need, and thank God we got mercy. And God gives us mercy. Probably the, the man, the scripture calls him the man after God's own heart was David. We know of David's life. We know uh, I've, I've taught a lot on him, preached a lot on him, understand his life. There's a parallel with his life and many of our lives. And you realize that he, he's a giant slayer. He's a psalmist, sweet psalmist of Israel. He's a man who, uh, who loves war, goes after things. But yet in David's life, there, there came a time where David took a, a lax moment, stayed home, wrong place, wrong time, looking at the wrong thing. Of course, he saw Bathsheba from afar and wanted her. And, and just to narrate Scripture very quickly, the Scripture tells us that God would have given him any woman in the kingdom. But the thing with Bathsheba, she had a man who was considered a brother to him. And when that happened, of course, David uh, got with Bathsheba. There was a pregnancy there and after the pregnancy Uriah was killed uh, was set up but this is the whole issue how David handled his situation and that's what got me and the scripture says that that child was born and if you look with me if you have your scriptures here in chapter 12 verse 16 David pleaded with God for the child the child became ill he fasted and he went into his house and he spent the nights lying on the ground the elders of his household stood beside him to get him up from the ground. But the king, David, refused. He would not eat any food with them. On the seventh day, the child passed. David's servants were afraid to tell him that the child was gone, had died. For they had thought, while the child was still living, we spoke to David, but he would not listen to us. How can we tell him the child is dead? He may do something desperate. David noticed that his servants were whispering among themselves, and he realized the child was dead, and he asked the question, Is the child gone? They said, Yes, he is dead. Verse 20, Then David got up. I'm sorry, I'm in 2 Samuel. Yeah, yeah. I could, yeah, the Holy Ghost just nudged me through the voice of a woman over here. So, Y'all ever had that happen? The Holy Ghost nudged you through the voice of a woman? Yeah, absolutely. My bad. Chapter 12, I'll be in verse 20. Then David got up from the ground. After he had washed, he put on lotions. One scripture says he anointed himself with oil, changed his clothes. He went into the house of the Lord, and he worshiped. Then he went to his own house, and he ate at his request. They served him food, and he ate. Father, I need you to take a, come in and visit us. I need to hear your voice speaking through my mental faculties. God, I need to share what's on my heart to your people. God, I bless you, and I thank you for all the goodness in Jesus' name. And everyone say Amen. Amen. Everybody say investment. Amen. Investment. We've talked about investment over the last couple of weeks. Whatever you invest in is what you, whatever you sow, you're going to reap. Whatever you put into is going to come back to you in time. You only have so much time in life. I'm sitting here, and I teared up. Because I looked over at little JJ and I started thinking about her being little and how fast she's growing. But I also thought about my own daughter 20-something years ago when she was eight, seven, eight years old, competed over here in the 4-H 
uh, a little rodeo and won a bunch of ribbons at her first rodeo. And now her little daughter's growing up. She got the jeans, a little sassiness about it. And I'm seeing this repeat itself as you, as you move through life. And I realize we are moving so quickly. And I'm not, I know I'm not old, but the, the bottom line is I, I look back and I feel a little bit aged. You follow where I'm going? And, and, and I think about all the things that have taken place in my life as I've, I've moved through ministry, and you, you do your best to, to, to be the best that you can. But as you, as you move through life, last week was horrible for our nation. Of course, there was a, a shooting in El Paso. There was one in Dayton, Ohio. And, and, then, and I know what true victims are. I understand that. But what I started witnessing in the body of Christ, and one of the things I understand is God made us overcomers. He made us to overcome. Nowhere that I can find in the Bible does it teach you whatever you have gone through in life, lay down and quit. Become the victim. Because sit back and say, well, I, I was in the military, I'm a victim. I went through divorce, I'm a victim. I had a child die, I'm a victim. You know where? The Bible will not give you permission to say, I had cancer, I'm a victim. I got diabetes, I'm a victim. I, I've, got, I've got a big nose, I'm a victim. Nowhere in Scripture does it give you permission to sit back and feel sorry for yourself. You got a little time to get over it, to grow and mature, but you don't get to. So David with his child, and I just want to set it up, as that baby that he loved, he's praying seven days, he's fasting, he's believing God, because he knows God at times will shift. He knows that God will change his, he can change his mind here. So he's believing for this baby. And as he's doing that, nothing's happening. Nothing, the baby's getting worse, and I've watched this in my own life. I have prayed for people, and I have seen miracles. David, good to see you here. Speaking of miracles, Pat up here on this stage, miracles. Yesterday I did a wedding for a man who has uh, his body has over just the last few months broke out in cancerous tumors. I laid hands on him to help him steady himself, and I felt the nodules and the knots, and it reminded me, D, of a former boss of yours. Amen. And I, I, when I touched him, I, I soon I, my eyes teared up. I yanked my bandana off in the wedding, and I started praying fervently that God would heal this man and give him a life worth living with his new bride listen to me there's and he stood and he took it but the bottom line is nowhere in this word of god does it teach us just quit just lay down just feel so well but you don't know i did wrong of course you did live long enough please amen get around enough people and you'll find out yes there's slips there's failures there's sins there there, there. we're still fighting you know why there's ten commandments because we're apt to do the mess up on the other side of those. You know that. That Jesus said, love the Lord thy God with all your heart, soul, and strength, your neighbor as yourself. And we, we, we can still mess up even on that side. So we come here as a family of believers. And nobody in here, please, I know you enough to know. There's no self-righteous in here. There's nobody perfect in here. There's nobody got it all together in here. So as we come in here, we, we don't, are no longer victims. Now, how do you know, Pastor, that somebody invested in, and keep investing in your past. See, when we think investment, we think future. But a lot of times, I meet people that keep investing in their past. They keep looking back to their past. And this is where you got to fight it. Because your mind, man, your mind can take you back to where you were. And I, I choose to try to remember the good times, the good memories, all the things that took place and are, are taking place. But don't invest. And I, I, I see it. You begin to focus on the past. You, you invest in the, you concern yourself with how things should have been. You get preoccupied with problems. You're always blaming someone else for the way you are. You find yourself helpless. You feel you have no control over anything. You feel like pawns in the game of life. You hear the expressions from your mouth, if only or what if. Uh, you feel like they're always being picked on. And that, as you see, a person who is consumed with any of the above symptoms would have a hard time walking in any sense of victory. A victim's mentality does not bring victory. If you maintain that, you will remain a victim. God has something better for us. Psalm 43, 1, are you comfortable? You thought I missed it, didn't you? <laughs> Psalm 43, 1. Vindicate me. This is David talking. Vindicate me, O God, and plead my cause against an ungodly nation. Deliver me from the deceitful and unjust man, for you are the God of my strength. Next verse. Why do you cast me off? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? Oh, send out your light and your truth. Let them lead me. 
Let light and let truth lead me. Amen. Because I, I feel like I have been oppressed. I feel like a victim. I feel like I'm being put down. So at this moment, I need truth and I need light. It is the only thing that's going to bring the kind of victory that causes us to break free from the bondage of the past. It's the Word of God. I thank God for this book. It won't leave me where I was. It's constantly telling me to press on. Paul said, I press on for, for that which I can take hold of. I'm not looking back here or investing anymore in my past. Amen. There's something about whenever you do that, you, 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 you'll see even your countenance can change. Father, I thank you for the word of God. I thank you for vindicating us. I thank you that your mercy wraps around us. I give you praise for all the good things come from you. And everybody said, amen. God bless you. You may be seated. I'm going to walk you through a couple of things very quickly. First, you have to face the pain, and you've got to deal with it. David did that. He faced the pain, and he dealt with it. You have to be willing to take a good, hard look at your life. You have to discern how much of a victim you've become, and then be willing to see that, that what it was that caused us to fall into the snare when we must begin to deal with it by making straight paths for our feet. Hebrews tells us this in verse 12. Therefore, strengthen the hands that hang down. And the feeble knees. Do you know how many times I prayed that? I prayed it in that back room a while ago with the band. Because some of them were hurting. I look at the scripture and I say, okay, strengthen the hands which hang down. Then feeble knees. Make straight paths for your feet so what is lame may not be dislocated. But rather be healed, pursue peace with all men in holiness, without which no one is going to see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest anyone fall short of the grace of God, lest any root of bitterness springing up cause trouble, and by this many become defiled. Now, we spent a lot of time on this last part because we've talked about bitterness. we talked about how it gets in your life, how it affects other people, how hurt that's not dealt with becomes uh, anger that's not dealt with becomes hurt. Hurt becomes bitterness, and bitterness will always lead to, to murder. Be careful with that. But in the beginning of this, it's just strengthened. Strengthen the hands that hang down. And I know as you get older, uh, as you move it, as you work it, your hands get tired, and, and you got you got to talk to yourself. I was at that little car show Friday night, and I saw a young man walking up to me. And as he was walking up, he was picking his feet up real high. And, and you know, you got to be one to know one. And as soon as I saw him walking up, he said, and, and, and the word came to me, Pastor, he wants to talk to you about your car. He loves your purple Mopar. Well, why shouldn't you? Everybody should. Amen. But I walked over, and I, I talked with him. I started talking with him. But I want to talk to him about him. And as soon as I asked him, what your, your name's Glenn. Glenn, I noticed the way you walk. You, he started, I, I apologize, sir. I have a foot drop. Uh, muscular dystrophy. That's why I have to, uh, but I apologize. And he started apologizing. And I looked at him and I said, quit. Quit apologizing for something you didn't ask for. You're not a victim here. Can I get an amen? Don't, don't apologize for it. I just want you to know I understand you. I feel for you. I've had surgeries to stop my foot from falling to the ground. I still stumble and fall. Almost weekly I go to the ground because one foot still wants to drop. But I want you to know there's somebody here that relates to you in life. And you don't have to go through life feeling like you don't. Stop apologizing. You don't have to do that. And then he said, I, 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 it's like immediately we became friends. And I started introducing him to others. But there's just something about that kind of connection. Strengthen, strengthen, do something. So in the process of looking at our wound and our pain, we come to the conclusion that we have some major forgiveness and bitterness. we we got to deal with that. We understand that. But this has to be dealt with before the bondage can be broken. So God asks you to forgive me. I ask you to take the bitterness from my life. But I want my hands that have been hanging down to lift up. I want my knees to be strengthened. Amen. See, what happens is victims refuse to release. When you're a victim, you don't, you don't want to let go. That's why Jesus said in Mark eleven twenty five, 25, and whenever you stand praying, if you have anything against anyone, forgive them. That your Father in heaven may also forgive your trespasses. But if you do not forgive them, neither will your Father in heaven forgive your trespasses. You know what a trespass is? Uh, let me break it down to you. The sign on the fence where the barbed wire is says, do not trespass which means this ain't your land don't come across here as a young boy i seen them signs all the time they were around the watermelon patch that when i went in to steal the watermelons 
they were at Charlie Johnson's field, that if I could cut across it, I could save 15 minutes getting to Rex's house? One time. One time I trespassed across there. Did you know that a 10-year-old boy can't outrun a white Brahma bull? <laughs> you can't do it. By the way, this is the same thing. Now, I can't even tell you about No. I, you know, I'm, I've been with y'all long enough. I some stories are hard to say till I'm 60. <laughs> right? Maybe, maybe they'll come back to me later. But once I clear up the bitterness and resentment, I have to begin to focus on the solution and quit investing or focusing on the problem that I keep going back and becoming the victim. So second here, you have to take responsibility for your life. In order to maximize your life, you have to minimize your load. Overloaded people fail. Overloaded people fail. That's why I don't use the word busy. That's why I talk about being effective. That's why I look at my day and I say, okay, you know, hey, listen, I'd have loved to come over here yesterday and hang out with the kids. But yesterday morning, I had a breakfast for, the, for camp. I had a men's breakfast. I had ropes course. And then I had something else I committed to at 12 o'clock just to go over for a biker that, that was hit in a hit and run that, that needed, a, a, needed somebody to support him. So I knew you had all of this. So if you try to overload yourself, you're going to fail. So you've got to learn how to, to work your time. They, all, you know, they, they always have, they always will. They fail. You'll fail at, if you overload, you'll fail at marriage, at ministry, at management. You'll fail at parenting and partnership. You'll fail in your professional endeavors. Like an airplane that can only carry a certain amount of weight, too much baggage, you can't fly. So you've got to start getting rid of some of the baggage or decide I'm going to have to leave some of that behind in order to make this trip. I, I, I don't know. I, I can make a trip, in, in, and I'm trying, trying to boast, but I can make a three, four, five, six, ten-day trip on a motorcycle with two pair of jeans. Ain't no problem. And buy T-shirts on the way. Now, I don't mean it's mean, but bring your wife. Oh, you know young, right? Huh? You know what I'm talking about. They'll be asking, how's, how's the weather? What's this going to happen? That's gonna, no, not all of them, but, but that's a rule. Uh, yeah, I see, I see going on a two- or three-day trip, and it's like, what are we doing? This plane can't even get off the ground. It's to, it's to, well, and I, I, here's one of the things I learned in life. If you've if you got a little pocket money, always pack light because you never know what you might get to buy. But if you fill it up too full, you can't bring nothing home. Okay, this is just going on. Just, just talking. Everybody say it's my responsibility. You cannot stay a victim the rest of your life. It's your responsibility. No matter who or what you have, have caused you to fail. Amen. David, the Bible says, he got up and he washed himself. He anointed himself. He changed his clothes. It is our responsibility to get out of it. You got to quit blaming and feeling sorry for yourself and take responsibility for your life. Nobody else can do that for you. You, you, got, you got to come to your senses. The prodigal son is a great story about this in Luke chapter 15. This prodigal son is an example of a person who fell into the trap of a victim. It, it, but his his victory was predicated on the fact that he took responsibility for his actions. He didn't accept the fact that he was a victim. Do you remember what happened? He took his father's inheritance early. He went off in riotous living. When you see the word riotous living, that means he partied. He did whatever he wanted. And you, you can say, well, what is, because that's the big deal today, what exactly is sin? Anything that, uh, that comes against the knowledge of God, anything that would hurt God. Why, why do we try to make rules? You know, the scripture's full of rules. But as, as, as a, a father, do you know my kids know when they've crossed over, hurt me? I, I ain't got to give them a list of rules for them to know that what they just did hurt me. Right. Amen. It affected me. I, I had a situation on, on Friday. I was, I was rushing, trying to get things done. I pulled my motorcycle out. I pulled my car out to get them washed. Uh, Sister Lori had something she needed me to do real quick also. And, and so I'm, I'm, I'm sw I mean, we're pouring sweat. We've been working all day. And, and, and I look at my son, Josiah, and at 3 o'clock he's heading home. I said, son, would you come and help me wash these vehicles? And he looked at me, and he, and he wasn't mean about it. He said, no. <laughs> he, he just said, no, no. And, and being the dad I am, I didn't 
chastise him or, or throw rocks at him or beat him up or, or tell him I'm taking the keys to the truck away that I helped you get, uh, you know, because uh, I gave you the car that helped you get the truck after you, the car was flooded. I didn't, I didn't backtrack and give him a history of just how good I am. You follow me? You see where I'm going? That's the Will you help me wash it? No. And he drove off. And he, honestly, Ronnie, I was disappointed. I was hurt. But I didn't give him a list of do's and don'ts. But he knew that his daddy's sweating. And it wasn't but a few minutes later, I looked, and here come that truck back up the road. And he got out. And I didn't have to say one word. I didn't have to say, feeling guilty, are you? Huh? You know, we do that. But God didn't do that to us. And I, so, so he came over and he said, and he just he grabbed the rag and started washing stuff. And honestly, I had to leave him with it to go help Sister Lori with something. And while I was gone, he finished the job, drove off. You know, I've not heard a word from him since. Send him a thank you. It's all good. I didn't have to. And many times we're, we're almost like demanding God, give us a list. Tell us the do's and don'ts. Just ask yourself, will this hurt God? And if it hurts God, then don't do it. Amen. It's that simple. If, if he's something you know that he would love, then, then you do it. So the scripture says this, sir, this guy goes out. He spends all of his money. He ends up in a pig pen. You know all of that. And then he decides, I got I to get up. He comes to his senses. But he could have said this. He could have played the victim and said, if only the severe famine hadn't happened. If only there wasn't a famine, I would be better off right now. If only the hurricane hadn't hit us, we'd be in good shape now. If only this thing hadn't happened in my life, I would be in good shape. But instead, the Bible says he came to his senses. That means your brain can go places that it doesn't need to stay. And he brought his mind back. And once he got his mind right, but when he came to himself, his senses, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare and I perish with hunger? I will arise, go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before you. You know the rest of the story. The father met him, ran toward him, kissed him, put a robe on his back, put a ring on his finger, put shoes on his feet, killed the fatted calf, threw down a party. You don't read where the father says, and interrogated him and said, Now let me ask you, that riot is living? What does that mean? Who was she or how many she's were there? Hello? There was a sense of celebration that one came home and was no longer playing the victim. You have to have clearly established goals and priorities. i got to move quick. Amen. But another thing that can keep you from playing the victim, Proverbs 21.5, the plans of the diligent lead surely to plenty, but those of everyone who is hasty surely to poverty. Diligent plans, make plans. If we don't take control of our lives by establishing goals and priorities, circumstances and others will do it for us. They just come in and they, they take over. You've got to make plans. But next one, you've got to be kingdom-minded. If you want to keep from being a victim. Well, Pastor, here's our problem, one of our problems. Some of us are too American. Everything is about America. I, I am a patriot. I love this nation. But I'm a believer in Christ first. I, mean, I have a world global view. I see what's going on in the world. And I look at it and I say, God, I, I don't know what you've got planned for this nation. But I, for one, want to turn back to you and tell you I love you. Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Amen. All these things. In other words, well, yeah, I, I complain about this and that, but if I just seek after him, he's going to take care of me. If I am to break free from the past, I must begin to shift my focus on something much more important that will occupy my mind and thoughts. As I, you know, and I thought to myself, what happened to me back 40 years ago? Now 40 years ago. What happened to me is that I, everything in my life shifted. It wasn't about the, the victim mentality or what I had as a, as a hillbilly. But now I was looking at this kingdom of God and everything that was in, involved in church and family and brothers and sisters and all these things became, became more important. Our lives are made up of a series of choices. And if those choices were made according to carnal and selfish desires, we're going to become a victim all the time. But on the other hand, if I'm making right choices that are in relationship to seeking first the kingdom of God, I'm going to release this flow of blessing and abundance. Again, we go back to the law of sowing and reaping. Whatever I sow, I'm going to reap. If I sow into my past and I remind myself I'm a victim all the time, I will stay a victim. One of the greatest things God can do for you is to remind you that you're his kid and right, raise you up out of that and cause you to stop looking. Stop looking. at, at uh, And I know there are other people that have 
worse lives than you and, and, uh, or better lives than you. It's all relative. That's relative. What did I tell you a week or two ago? You didn't ask to be born in Texas. You just were. So quit acting all Billy really bad about it. <laughs> yeah, he's like you, like you did that. You made yourself a Texan. A little arrogance here, <laughs> right? H, you seen it? You seen it? Being from Alabama, we both seen it. You know, and so we we get this idea that just because we, we, it is what it is, that might have been a better name of this sermon. It is what it is. You got to deal with life. It is what it is. What? 2 Corinthians 9 says, Now may he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food supply and multiply the seed you have sown and increase the fruits of your righteousness. Look at that first part. Now he who supplies seed to the sower. Everything you've sowed in life, good. God gave you seed to sow it. You know, you, you didn't purchase it. God gave it to you. Now, if you have that seed, it's your, your, your call on where you're going to sow the seed. And when you sow the right ways, amen, God, the Bible says, is going to make it come back to you. So, Pastor, how do I stop investing in my past? First, face your pain and deal with it. Own it. Own it. And I, I would say to you, def, be in defiance of stuff. Stand in defiance. You know, my mom used to tell me all the time, she says, you're in denial. I'm not in denial. I, I know my fingers are crooked. I know I have weaknesses in my legs. I know there's certain things. And, and you, you, many of you got the same, you got issues. You got to look at it and say, okay. Don, I know you struggle breathing. You know, that it'll come on you. And we'll pray for you to get well. That We, we see that. But I, I'm not in denial of it. It's, it's happened to my body. But I'm in defiance. I'm going to defy this thing. Amen. I'm going to say, I'm not going to let this thing beat me or define me. Second thing is, you have to take responsibility for your life. you got to say, you know, this is my life. This is what I got. This is where I am. I'm going to make the best of this life. I'm not going to invest in, my, in the past with a victim mentality. I'm going to go forward. Third, I have to have clearly established goals and priorities. Where am I heading to? Write it down if you need to. But remind yourself, i got to move forward. For, next one, you got to be kingdom-minded. The kingdom of God is so important in your life. The king's domain. Life is too short to allow ourselves to be an inmate in the prison of bad choices and weak decisions. Amen. The person of previous mistakes and a victim's mentality that comes with a jailer's of guilt and regret, I, I, don't, I don't need it. Don't spend another night in a graveyard of guilt dealing with the corpse of your past. David prayed. He prayed. God, let my baby live. What is your baby? Is it your job, your business? Is it a relationship? What, what is it that you prayed for? You wanted to live. Because after he prayed, the scripture says he anointed himself with oil. I, I, and I can tell you, I don't know how this works. I don't know how the anointing that, that we anoint ourselves. I don't, I don't know how aspirins work. I don't, I don't know how toothpaste works. I, I don't know how shampoo works. I just know if I don't put it on my head. I know if I don't, you put it on my toothbrush. I know if I don't take that aspirin, that head may keep hurting. I don't know, I don't know how, the, how this, but I understand this. I do understand the anointing. The brokenness that comes with the anointing oil. I, I understand all of those things. But when I anoint myself, what I'm saying is, God, I'm still yours. I'm still yours. I can't find a pastor. I can't find a peer. I can't find a prophet. But personally, I'm yours. And nobody else around. He anointed himself, the scripture says. He inquired of the truth. He rose from the ground. If you don't get up, you're going to give up. You got to keep going. You can't stop. You don't understand. Yes, I do. You got to get up. He washed himself. It's an act of moving out of depression. When I clean up, when I look good. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah. Some of you know what I'm talking about. When, when, you, when you clean up, you look good and you know it. Huh? <laughs> when you stand in front of the mirror and you say, dog. <laughs> Not bad. I had a guy, a 30-something-year-old dude in the church. 
said something about me being ugly. And I said, well, you wait till you're 58. You, you ain't even going to look this good, son. I promise you. <laughs> look at you now. Use one of them age apps. I promise you, you, you ain't got to go there. He anointed himself, changed his clothes, got a new attitude, and he went to the house of God and he worshiped. What well, worship clears things up. Worship says, God, I'm still yours. I know the child is gone. And then, then he claimed the truth of God. He anchored to the book. Amen. He began his response to others may not be normal. They expected him to fall apart. Some people have seen your life. They expect you to fall apart. You got a bad diagnosis. This happened. You should fall apart. Somebody you loved is gone. You should fall apart. He didn't do it. What we see in David was this unusual word. I shared about it on the internet this week. He relinquished. He relinquished, which means to let go. Just let it go. Somebody say, let it go. Just let it go. It's not in our nature to let go of anything. That's why we got storage buildings. That's why a sister got a she shed. Cheryl got a she shed. And he got a he shed. Hello. Don't tell me he ain't got a he shed. He got a he shed too. She got a she shed. We don't let go of stuff. Try to hang on to it. But relinquishing is to allow it to go. That thing that was dear, let it go. Sooner or later, when it comes to letting a loved one go, we have to turn it over to God. And we have to relinquish them into the hands of the one who created them and loves them. And maybe it's not you, but my phone will ring sometime this week and somebody will be mad. Somebody will be upset because somebody passed away. How could my 95-year-old daddy die? Pastor, why would God allow that to happen? My answer is pretty easy. Because he didn't allow it when he was 94, 93, 92, 91, 90, 89, 88, 87. Why don't you give God thanks for the years you had him? David knew he had to govern. He knew that he had to be a father. He knew he had to be a husband. He knew there were people that he needed to care for. Remaining children, support, and guide. So he knew that he couldn't just stay where he was. So he got up and he made this powerful statement that the child, the child can't come here to me. Do you understand the power of the Old Testament? The Old Testament doesn't tell us about heaven. Very little about heaven. The Old Testament doesn't tell you about salvation so much. It just tells us about turning to God. It tells us about God coming on people but not in people. That's the Old Testament. So they have limited revelation and understanding. So when David makes his proclamation, Charlie, it's huge. When he said, that child cannot come to me. But one day I'm going to go see that child. I read that and it hits me that really, I've not lost anything. Amen. They stored up for me. There are treasures stored up for me. There are people stored up for me. I will see them again. Amen. I will see them again. So I stand every time on faith, believing this book. Call me crazy. I can't find anything else in life worth living for. I can't find anything else I can put my, my feet. I sure don't want to live as an atheist to say this is all it is, especially now that I'm 58 when I should have done that. When I, if I want to be an atheist, I should have started that at 18. Should have partied on through life. Now I'm too old to do that. So I'm going to stand on what I've invested in. I've invested in the kingdom of God and the word of God and the people of God. So that's my investment. And I got to quit looking back at my past and saying, well, you know what should have been, could have been. I can't do that. Amen. I got to look forward and see what I got left. I don't say anything. Well, I ain't got a whole lot. Yes, you do. You matter. I was, went to see Ann Havard on Thursday. She'd just been moved to a little assisted living place. She said, Pastor, I got mad. I ran away. She said, I ran away. She's telling me this. She's sweet, you know. She said, I ran, I ran right out that gate. And I didn't get far. I said, tired. I just laid down. She said, I got about five, ten yards outside the gate. I was too tired. I just laid down. 
She said, I just gave up. She said, they let me come back in. They said, you don't do that again. She said, I don't get no more chances. I got to be nice. What I'm listening to is a woman that knows what she's doing. She, she's lived life. She's invested in life. But when she hugged me, she invested in my life. When she said, I love you, Pastor, she invested in my life. I don't care your age. You still have investment in this life. Ed, there's still future left. There's still things for us to do. There, there are people that, that lead to Christ. There are grandkids to hug. Amen. There's life ahead. Don't invest in your past no more. It's over. Let's invest in our future. Can you get an amen? Stand with me. Give God a praise in here. So what I read to you is simply this. The child transitioned. I know you said, well, the child died. What happened was, is when that baby died, I believe, according to the Word of God, that child went to heaven. There's innocence there. It's heaven. I also have this belief that there will be no nurseries in heaven, that their lives will be sped up to a certain age, and we'll know them as we know them. So that which I believe is this, that whatever David gave up on this earth, the hurt, the pain, and all that, will be multiplied when we get to heaven. Some of you have to have a different perspective. You have to start seeing things a little bit different. That I have not given, whatever I've given up here that hurt me, broke my heart here, there's going to be a life that God has for us because he loves us. It's going to be absolutely amazing. It's just one of those things I'm walking into. I'm just walking into, I'm, it's like I'm seeing this. Okay, God, okay. It, it wasn't that you, the child is gone. Did you know the scripture says that after this, David married Bathsheba? lay with Bathsheba, had a child, and they named the little boy Solomon, who wrote the book of Proverbs. Only God can take your messed up, dysfunctional, screwed up life and bring wisdom out of it. Only God can do that. Eyes closed, hands lifted. God, we submit ourselves to you today. We submit our dysfunctional, messed up lives. God, we are honest about this. God, we so need you to bring wisdom out of our lives, to do what you do so beautifully. God, we refuse to invest in the past any longer. God, our future is bright, so let us put our investments there. Let us believe you for the best. And accept the verdict in Jesus' name. Amen. Everybody looking at the preacher straight in the eye. Now come and look at me. Listen, I want you to say it with me. I will believe God for the best. And I'll accept the verdict. When I pray over people, I believe God for the best. God, I want the best. I want to see that good, better, best. Never let it rest. Your good is better and your better is best. I want the best in their life. But if you decide, God... That it's not going to happen. I'll accept the verdict. Why is that important, humans? Because if you don't, you'll get bitter. You'll get mad at God. You'll turn away from Him. But if I learn how to accept the verdict, do you know how many times I've prayed for healing in my legs? I'm still believing God for healing. I ain't backing off. I've had preachers yank my shoes off, yank on my feet, pray over them, lengthen my legs. I've been through all them little... Pentecostal, shimmy shings, you know. Tell me, take off running. I take off running on rocks. My feet are hurting, man. But I'm saying, God, you got to heal. And I walk in there and I look at the preacher. I lied to him when he said, You healed us. I'm healed. Now, I understand living by faith. I do. I understand the word of faith. That, that, let the weak say I'm strong. Let, let the poor say I'm rich. Let, the, yeah. let, let the, you know, uh, the blind say I can say. I understand that. So I'm going to keep believing for that. But on the flip side, what am I doing? I'm believing God for the best. And I'm accepting the verdict. And you got, if you've got to deal with it, you just deal with it. You keep moving. Yeah, I've, I've always got tickled at faith healers who wear glasses. <laughs> Miss Diane, I don't know if that ever bothered you, but it's always bothered me. If you're a faith healer, you shouldn't have to wear glasses. Hello. But I still believe in healing. I still believe God can raise up the dead. 
I still try. Still going after it. Amen. Amen. If I get our servant leaders to come up, you can be seated for a brief moment. What's going to happen? Come on, come on up, David. What's going to happen in September? This is important. If you don't listen to me, you're going to miss this. Starting in the September, the first week of September, first week, midweek. Everybody say first week, midweek. Say it again. Every first week of the month, there will be midweek service here. There will be a Tuesday night here and a Wednesday night in New Caney. The rest of the month, there will sign, we'll have sign-ups for you. Men, we're calling them the Knights of the Round Table. That's the men's group, the round table. In other words, everybody's on the same level. We're able to speak to one another, but it's going to be a group for men that in those three weeks, we will have a men's meeting somewhere between here and New Caney. And the men are going to gather. It might be at a bowling alley. It might be at a restaurant. It might be at a home, but we're going to let you guys know. Sign up. We're going to call you and let you know when. Ladies, there'll be, Marie's going to have a, a ladies' meeting somewhere in those three weeks. She's going to gather and Y'all going to talk lady stuff. All right? There's going to be a Zion's Lions meeting. If you're a biker, are you interested in biking? You ain't got your bike yet, but you believe in God for it? Huh? I'm telling you, God can do it for you. We're going to have a Zion's Lions meeting somewhere in those three weeks. The bikers are going to meet. Somewhere in those three weeks, Dennis is going to have a speed meeting. If you're a gearhead, you like hot rods? You ain't got one yet, but you still like hot rods? There's going to be a speed meeting somewhere in those three weeks. Somewhere between here and New Canaan. You follow where I'm going? So there are going to be fellowships around our interest. And there will be opportunities for you to do that. You just All you got to do is sign up, put your, your phone number. You'll get a phone call and tell you where it's going to be. When, I, when I'm telling you that, it tells sound like I'm going to be in almost every meeting but the ladies. Because I, I love hot rods. I love my bike. I, I, I love the guys. You know, I, I, just, I just want to be involved in it. But we're going to be fellowshipping through those times. Again, I mentioned I'm 58 years old. During those three weeks, it also gives me an opportunity to breathe. Where I can go to the meetings, but I can also get away. Maybe go see my grandkids. I ain't, I'm, I'm never going to get to retire. You know that. I, why would I want to do that? I can't retire. I don't know. Don't let me say that. But as a rule, I don't know how. I don't know how to do it. This is what I enjoy doing. But I'm so proud of you who do retire. That you get a chance to go do things in life. I think that's that's fantastic. But hunting season's coming up. That means I got a little time to go. So what are you saying, Pastor? You being selfish, preacher. No, I've let a lot of life go. I pour my life into this, and I ain't, I'm not going to back off. But I'm, our band has been going for six years, five times a week, and they most of them work jobs. But they got well, I know all of them work jobs. Five times a week. Two on Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday night practice. Somewhere you got to back off and breathe. Okay, one more thing before you get your envelope or you give on your phone. I met with the pastors of Crosby in Barrett Station Thursday at a, at a meeting. And they asked of me, Pastor, would you host the Thanksgiving service this week? Now those who have been with me go back with me a few years ago. We used to do Thanksgiving services in Crosby with the churches and community together. So on Sunday night before Thanksgiving, it'll be Sunday night at 6 o'clock, we're going to host the Thanksgiving community service here. We're the host church, which means we're going to be on the best behavior. <laughs> All right? Here's the other thing he said. They said, if we have it at your church, Pastor, we know your people, it'll be full. They said that. I didn't say that. They said, y'all going to show up. So then I threw a little something after the meeting was over. I thanked them, and they thanked me and all that. But I sent a message to the leader of the group, and I said, I have not heard Bishop Ron Eagleton preach in years. If you've never heard Bishop Ron Eagleton, Mount Rose Church of God in Christ, preach, if you've not been with his people in a service, you don't know what church can be like. We do it one way, they do it another. Put us together and they get stupid. So I throw the gauntlet down to have him preach that, that night. We'll see what happens. But I'm excited. 
I'm excited about the future of the little country church. Amen. If you need to tie the offering envelope, lift your hand. If you give them by phone, just wave your phone at them when they come by. I'm giving online, Pastor. I'm giving online. Amen. So much to do. August 11th, swap seniors with a purpose. That is today after service. See Miss Linda and Ken. Um, August 16th through the 17th. Anything you want to say about that? Yeah, ladies, if you have not signed up yet, please make sure you sign up in the back. If you're staying in a room with somebody, um, you still need to sign up in the back. I'll be sending out an email this week um, to everybody that's going to be going. And if you have any questions for me, I'll be in the back. Yeah, if you're going on the motorcycle ride um, to Canton, October 3rd through the 5th, make sure you go ahead and get your rooms booked. Um, you should have been given a flyer um, in the last couple of weeks. So if you're just thinking about it, um, I encourage you to go. I mean, um, the rides for the men, the men are going to go on rides, and some of the ladies will ride with them as well. But um, we just have so much fun, not just shopping, but being able to fellowship and get away and be together. So um, if you have any questions about that, I'll be in the back as well, and you need to sign up for that too. Thank you. There you go. And there's something about when we, we aren't on an agenda. We just go to hang out. Like, that's the idea. It, it, we can really relax and just have a lot of fun. Um, August 17th, Jewels for Christ. See Miss Diane Spurlock in the back. Um, August 18th, List um, the Ladies. See Miss Diane Phelan. And uh, is, are you going to be in the back or anything? Just If you guys, you just wave your hand. There you go. If you want to be involved in that, see Miss Diane Um and that's pretty much it. Again, Pastor said it today. Uh, he used the scripture up there, and he talked about God gives seed to the sower. Listen, God gives to the giver. Think about it. Just saying. God gives to the giver. He does not give to the one that's always taking. But he does give seed to the sower. So let's be sowers. Amen. Today we're believing God for jobs and better jobs. More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commissions. Checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts to malls, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom.